Reaching the highest point in the Netherlands is not really much to boast about. It's maybe worth a funny photograph for social media and a, a joke amongst your hiking friends. But add another 27 country high points to the list like Mont Blanc, Tede, Mont Pico, Ben Nevis, and doing them all in 28 days, that's something that earns you a throne in the pub for life. My guest this week, Ian O'Brien, he did just that this year. And he did, did it all while managing a life with, while developing early onset Parkinson's disease. The log logistics of the travel alone would cause ChatGPT to implode, but Ian and his crew managed to, to scale all 28 within that 28 day goal. But as all epic adventures go, it didn't come without any suffering or failure. With Ian's condition, some of the climbs were extremely challenging and the descents were even more risky. Despite all that, that, he defeated the odds and he reached his final peak here in Ireland, summiting Karen Tuhill on the 2nd of July, 2023. I really enjoyed my conversation with Ian. He reminds us all that anyone can do these difficult things. Maybe it's not summiting all 28 of the highest points in Europe in four weeks, but we all have the power to conquer our own mountains. And most importantly of all, that the best adventures are those that are shared. This is The Hiker Podcast. I am Owen Hamilton, and here's my conversation with Ian O'Brien. Life is good, yeah. Um, took a while to adjust after what I did. Um, so I haven't really been in the hills much since I've done that the event, you know, uh, slowly getting back into it. But um, yeah, it was, it was a great event and glad I did it. And would I do it again? Not sure, but I'll, I'll see. <laughs> a few things yeah. obviously. I think it. Uh, I think a lot of people can relate to that as well. I can definitely relate to that. Doing something as monumental and something that took so much training and logistics and planning and everything. It's really hard to go. Well, like I love the you love the feeling of accomplishment, but then you're like, well, let's do yeah, that again. I mean, yeah, during the event, I was thinking of other things to do. You know, as like yeah. you know, as if like kind of just occupying your brain what else could i do and stuff like that then like you said when you finish you're going all right maybe i shouldn't shouldn't be thinking about what i want to do next but you know slowly you start coming around again and the body starts going oh maybe i could do something else so you yeah, have a few things up my sleeve but uh i can't tell my wife yet <laughs> <laughs> yeah she'll probably murder you uh but I'll, I'll i can be that little red devil on your on your shoulder telling you go on do it <laughs> Um, so yeah, I suppose uh, I have dove straight into it. Do you want to, do you want to kind of give a, a bit of an overview of exactly what you did this year? Yeah. So, um, I took on a challenge to climb the highest point in each of the EU countries and the UK. So 27 EU countries and the UK is 28 countries. And I challenged myself to get to the top of the 28 play, play points in 28 days. So it was, uh. Yeah, so I always say it sounds more exotic than it than it actually was because you know some mountains, some countries are quite low lying, like yeah. Denmark and Holland and stuff like that. But it was still a logistical challenge to get to all those places and then actually get to their high points. Um, and then obviously you had serious high points like Mont Blanc and uh, Rose Glockner in Austria and so on and so forth. But it was a great adventure, and it did take a lot of planning. It's probably. Probably started planning it about four years before that, and then COVID kicked in. And I kind of forgot about it, and then I was thinking about it. And I said it to a couple of friends, and like, just go for it, like you know. So uh, I did, and it was a pretty, pretty good adventure. So it wasn't necessarily four years in the making, uh, four years in the planning. It was four years in the making that was conceived back back four years ago. Yeah. So what I did four years ago uh, when I came up with the idea. I said, right, is it logistically possible? And based on the flights in that year and the logistics of that year, I put it together. And once I know it could be put together, I know I could, you know, roll it out. It wouldn't be the exact same flow and stuff like that, but I knew I could kind of work it around. And so I did. So, like, the planning was hours and hours. Like, you'd, you'd plan everything, and then the flight would change, and I would throw everything out, or the date, like, I was doing Mont Blanc, and the, the tour company was doing to change the date by one day, and that threw everything out, and took me three months to put it back together. Tried a couple of crazy things like in the middle of it, Ireland were playing Greece over in Greece, and I tried to see if I could be in Greece and get the match in as well. <laughs> yeah, it was a bit so like I actually spent a month doing that, like uh, that didn't work out, but um, yeah, it was just 
trying to get the flow right, whether to use flights, whether to use trains, whether to drive. Um, so yeah, at the end of it, probably more proud of the logistics coming off than actually mm. the physical feet of it. Like you know, but uh, the whole lot was was pretty cool. Yeah, no, it, it like I, I remember when we first spoke and you sent me the map or you sent me the we- your website and then I looked at the map and I was just like, that is because you're going from here to here and then you're doubling back on yourself and you're crisscrossing all over the place. It just it looked, yeah, it, it's a I'm. I don't know if you ever like doing this, but if you complete an activity like a hike or a run or like that, and you just look at the map on, you know, whatever platform, a Strava or a hike or like that, and you just look at the at the map of what you've done, you're like, yeah, I did that. <laughs> you know, it's very, it's like a trophy. Yeah, no, it's, it's pretty cool. And then like planning the, the routes for each of the individual hikes and on top of the, the major logistics of moving around, you know, um, totally wouldn't have been possible without my f- friends and people that joined me like along the way, you know, um, at some points there was I was dropped to the bottom of a mountain, I'd start climbing, they'd drive two hours to an airport, park the car, put the key on a on a on a wheel, take a picture of where the car was, they'd get in a plane, and someone else would fly in from somewhere else, they'd turn on their phone, find out where the car was, get in the car and drive to the bottom of the mountain, collect me as I got off it and off to the next place. Like so it was logistics going all over the place, where to stay, where to eat, all that kind of stuff. So um yeah, like back to what I said, it came off. I was very lucky, like, you know, it was, it was, I planned it quite well and I built in like um, buffer zones like I, I'll always overestimate times of drives and over you know just to give myself a bit of extra time but still I was quite lucky where it came off in different places and it was hairy enough in some places like crossing from Romania to Bulgaria and uh, to cross over the, the Danube and okay got to, the, got to the point where it was a long drive from the end of, when we finished Romania and uh, we got to where and the last ferry had gone so there was another ferry leaving in an hour's time, an hour and a half down the road. So we had to get there as quick as possible. And yeah, it was two or twelve o'clock at night, and it was all a bit, a bit weird and wonderful. But it came off in the end, you know. Yeah, it's fantastic. I, I guess the the big question people are probably thinking is, is why did you do this? Why? What was the the motivation behind doing it in the first place? So I was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease five and a half years ago, and uh, the whole story of behind that is a bit of a shock I was struggling for a while physically mentally and stuff like that so um yeah when I was diagnosed how I really got into hiking and stuff like that it was a friend of mine that was kind of involved and diagnosed me he's a physiotherapist and uh I went to movement issues in my right hand and he said that's all fine and I said to him it's like my brain tells my hand not to do and it won't do it and he got me to see a neurologist and I was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease and I went back to tell him and he goes Phew, I thought you could have, you know, there's a lot worse you could have. <laughs> so, and he goes, let's, let's climb Karen Tool at the weekend. And I, I was like, hang on a second, I just got diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. He goes, no, no, you love it, you love it. So we went down, we climbed Karen Tool. And since then, I really like, I was always into the outdoors and kind of, you know, but never really into hiking as much. So I'd like to get out for a walk more than anything. But uh, after I did that, I was like, okay, I got on top of Ireland's highest mountain and get on top of this diagnosis. And the brain just sort of flown from there. What are the high points is there and what else could I do? And that's kind of how it all came about. So from being told what, you know, this is a, a disease that's going to affect your mobility, affect your, your body. Um, you took this on as a challenge of saying kind of, well, no, I'm, I'm actually going to go the other way. I'm going to go yeah. and conquer every single mountain in Europe. <laughs> there's that there's been the stubbornness of it like you know just saying all right this is not going to define me there was wanting to do something because it's a it's a progressive disease you know there's no getting away from it. you get worse as time goes by so i wanted to do something epic that i could look back on in a few years time and say you know i did that while i, while I was able i wanted to spend some time with my mates and have a good time as well mm-hmm. i wanted to raise awareness for parkinson's because a lot of people when they think about parkinson's they think um older people, you know, shaking and stuff like that. And then there's, there's a small percentage of us that are diagnosed at a younger age. And I just want to spread that message that, you know, if you are diagnosed at a younger age, life doesn't need to stop. You still can do different things and you can kind of fight against it. And then the last thing is exercise is really, really good for it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it won't stop it, but it definitely slows it down and kind of for your mood and everything as well that goes with it. So, yeah, I, I want, they say excessive exercise. So I said, right, how can I push it to the limits, you know? <laughs> so, um, 
yeah, that's how it all came about. A couple of different things all kind of came together. And then lastly, just I was involved in setting up a charity in Ireland called EOPD, uh, EOPD.ie, which is early onset Parkinson's disease. So it was kind of fundraised for them as well. So fantastic. Yeah, a, whole lot, a whole lot came together. I can see on on the, the website that the, the dial is very, very close to the to the to the target of a hundred uh, is it a hundred grand or Yeah, and the, the hundred grand like when you're when you're setting up with these, you know, uh things on, on donation pages and stuff like that, you have to pick a target. I just picked a hundred grand randomly, like, you know, and never in my wildest dreams I thought twenty to thirty, fifty would be amazing. And yeah. I was in the photo interview and people were like, So you're looking for a hundred thousand? I was like, No, I'm not. I'm actually just trying to raise awareness and if we raise a bit of money along the way, good and well. So can't believe it's nearly at that, you know. Um, yeah, it's pretty, pretty awesome. I think 95 and a half is on that. And we've donated yeah. money to other uh, Parkinson's charities that aren't included in that as well. So we're probably at the 100 grand. But um, well, hopefully, it, it, the people, anyone listening to this, I'll be making sure to put it all into the show notes that people can go and click on the link and make a donation any you know as small or as big as they as they possibly can and get it close to that 100k you know i know it wasn't the real target but no, no, yeah, definitely not. It's, there, it's 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 uh it's 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 flashing in front of everybody even just talking today is really what i wanted to do is just talk about parkinson's yeah. and, uh, and then uh, talk about hiking as well like you know so uh, yeah 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 okay no, Okay, so I don't normally do these interruptions in the podcast, but before we dive into the rest of the conversation with Ian, I wanted to let you know about something big that's happening with Hiker this weekend. For this Saturday and Sunday, that's the 18th and 19th of November, 2023, we're dropping our paywall entirely and giving you access to all the amazing features of Pro Plus for free. That's completely for free. There's no credit card details required. You don't need to pay anything. It's not a free trial. You have unlimited access to our premium service for free. That gains you access to our premium topo maps like Harvey maps, East West mapping, NZ topo, Vic map, Swiss topo, OS maps, uh, to name but a few. There are so many maps that we have available in Pro Plus. You'll also have access to Live Locator, enabling you to share your live location through Hiker to your safety contacts, even if they don't have a Hiker account. Uh, there's so much more about Hiker Pro Plus that we'd uh, love for you to try out. So simply open up the app this weekend and check it out for yourself. Okay, sorry for the interruption. Let's get back to my conversation with Ian. Yeah, because I suppose you've got, normally when we're talking to people on this, on, on this, it's like, you know, how did you get into hiking? Why did you decide to do this one big long hiking trip? You know, maybe two, maybe three, but you did 28 and not and that's just on the ones that you um are included in the actual challenge you obviously trained a huge amount and you traveled while you were training as well so yeah um, um i i i'd done one or two like i've been to ben nevis a couple of times um i'd been to greece to do uh, olympus previous to that as well uh i did went to romania just before i actually started the trip just to kind of do a recce on that because it's a so way of doing it is you can come in from the north or in from the south. So I want to come in from the south to make it easier to get to the next point. There's a 40 kilometer dirt track to get into it. So I was kind of concerned about that. So my brother and I went over to do a recce and we forgot about the snow and stuff like that. So we actually had a very eventful 40 kilometers in, which we eventually had to stop because of a couple of avalanches that blocked the road. Okay. So we'd hike in. So I didn't actually get to the top of Romania when I went to my recce, but I got to see how bad the road was. And uh, yeah, the road ended up causing a bit of trouble, and we were on, on the way. The, the van didn't go back exactly the way it was given to us, but anyway, that's another story. That's why you have insurance for. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, like, what were some of the, what were some of the, I suppose, the highlights of the of the of the trip? Yeah, everyone asked me about the highlights, and the highlight was being in the van with my mates. Like, believe it or yeah. not, just driving around, having the crack, talking about different things. Um, that was, that was brilliant. But from the hiking point of view, so the first one, I, I, to, to get the challenge to fit into 28 days, I said, right, the clock starts when I hit the top of Mont Blanc. Mm-hmm. So the, I had a week over there to, before kind of be leading up to it where you'd climb Grand Paradiso in Italy, mm-hmm. uh, just over 4,000 meters. That was pretty class. But uh, a lot, again, a lot more snow that in this in June in, in Europe the, uh, this year because um, there's been a lot of rain that was obviously snow up the mountain. So a lot of hadn't kind of a, 
hadn't thought about the, the snow to, to the point where uh, how bad it was you know I thought I'd encounter it at very high points and stuff like that so but uh, so with my Parkinson's my balance is affected so walking in quite slushy snow and kind of deep snow so coming down off Grand Grand Paradis I must have fell a hundred times because you're just battling my foot would go down it'd sink a little bit put me off balance and I'd fall we were roped up to each other as well in different sections so like someone would pull a little bit in front my balance would go and I'd fall forward so yeah, that, the energy that took out of me, kind of having to, you know, I didn't want to let it affect the group, so I'd jump up again, you know, and keep trying to keep going, but eventually I, I finished that day and I was absolutely wrecked, and, you know, this is the first mountain I climbed, it's not part of the 28, and I'm already panicking, can I do this, like, you know, um, is it is it possible, so, yeah, I had a couple of moments there, kind of a bit of negative energy kind of going on, and then you go straight from that to do Mont Blanc, and uh, we got to Mont Blanc, and there's a train you take up about 1500 meters and uh, it's it's closed because uh, the snow so we have to hike that extra 1500 and again it's all leading into and then there's extra snow so we got to um tet rouge which is about 3200 meters up and i i struggled i had struggled i got there but i kind of you know my, my parkinson's was really starting to affect me you freeze a little bit when you're in Parkinson's, not because of the cold, but actually your gait, your, your, your step freeze. So I go take a step and the leg wouldn't move and I kind of, the brain's telling the leg to move and you're like, it's a slow reaction and you're, puts you all off. So yeah, I was quite worried. So I had a chat with the guides and I always said, whatever the guides say, I'll have to go with, you know, I'll have to take their recommendation. They're the experts wherever we are. And they said, look, you might get to the top, but coming back down, especially down the um, Goute Ridge, which is quite heavily uh, snow and ice at the time, it's very steep. Your balance isn't great. You're going to be roped to other people, and you know you could put yourself at risk and others at risk. So unfortunately, I had to say no. I, I will. They, they advised me, and I said, look, I have to take their advice. So I didn't get to the top of Mount Blanc, which was, you know, it's my first mountain in this challenge, and I kind of gone. I didn't get there, so. Uh, yeah, I took the news quite well. I was like, yeah, look, it is what it is. And then I kind of dwelled. And then I just said, oh, sugar, I can't believe this. Rang home, talking to my brother. Tears came out. It's like, oh, no, I failed in the first mountain. You know what I mean? So, but I kind of relaxed after that. And uh, kind of said, right, I didn't get to the top of this one. Whatever I do after this is a bonus. Um, so while I was kind of disappointed not re reaching the top, it kind of relaxed me for the rest of the month. It was like, and then and maybe that helped the rest of the month flow really well because everything went so well after that. Like, you know, so maybe it was a blessing in disguise. Um, kind of discussed that my Parkinson's was what, what got the best of me. Um, you know, I kind of could I trained a bit more, could I done a bit more on, on balance work? And believe it or not, just to run to jump to the end, like Karen Two was the last one. My balance in Karen Two was like it was amazing. Like, I ran up the Devil's Ladder and ran down it pretty much. And kind of go, if I put Mont Blanc at the end, would it have been easier when my balance got better? That was a big takeaway actually from the whole month is that my balance improved greatly because it was obviously put under pressure and I had to use it. So back to that, you know, exercise and excessive exercise. Yeah, the more you push your body, the more it learns and kind of gets better no matter what you have, you have to deal with, you know. So yeah, that was that was the first one. Yeah, it, 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 it's interesting that you say that about the... The like you considered it a failure, whereas like it, like as soon as I I hear that it like it's not a failure because you're doing this. The main reason why you were doing this was to raise awareness of of early onset Parkinson's, and and I suppose you you were learning yourself along this massive challenge, you know, and you know you did every other uh, peak, you did every other challenge that was set out in front of you for the rest of the, of, uh, of the entire month, um. And so I suppose you, you, it's not like you didn't go up Mount Blanc at all, at all. You made a considerable amount up and, you know, more than most other people would because he didn't have that train ride at the start as well. So yeah. it's interesting how you, you, you perceive that. Yeah, and, and the, the snow, like the, like Tet Rouge normally at that time of year has no snow at it. It was covered in snow as well, even at that 3,200 metres. So, yeah, these are all like, things to help myself, tell myself that it wasn't really my fault. But at the end of the day, it was my Parkinson's that got me. And I have to, you know, I have Parkinson's. I can't get away from it. And it's been wrong of me to go on. So, yeah, it was a learning curve. But, yeah, I, I, looking back now, I don't consider it a failure. I, I consider it a good move. You know what I mean? It's a smart move. And the good thing yeah. was two friends that were with me, they went on and got to the top. 
so they carried the flag for me you know what i mean and got to the top so that, that was really cool um yeah so after that then i flew f- from geneva to lisbon and out to pico island out in the azores which is somewhere i'd never think about going you know it's such a random place to go but a beautiful island really beautiful island and uh, the climb was tough enough nothing compared to mont blanc or anything like that but it, it's a volcanic um mountain so the mad thing is uh, your grip was amazing like it's a rock that you look at in ireland and you go i'm not going to stand in that because at a 45 degree angle and it's wet there you just totally grip to it because the pot you know the porous kind of rock that, yes. that it is. yeah it's quite easy your brain had to learn that you know what i mean he's like step there step there and you're like no no i'll slip and do no no you'd be fine um so that was really that's pretty cool nice place to go and um people lovely food was really nice uh, like i said a different part of the world i'd never think about going to and you did um you also did uh tay day as well you did a tay day in uh, in tenerife the uh, spanish highest point yeah so i flew down there and the to get to squeeze this into 28 days it was to get to the highest point so like i did use whatever was available so in tay day i went there and visited and the, the cable car was not working that day because the wind oh right right so yeah that was the other one i didn't get to the top of but i was there and kind of took all the photographs and stuff of that so yeah i had six hours there and pretty much you flew in i was like drive there a lovely couple that uh work with parkinson's people with parkinson's in the canary islands met me drove me there unfortunately the wind was bad so we luckily took all the pictures and they got me back to the flight so yeah, I think that was the other second one that I didn't get to the top of, but obviously made, made it there and kind of ticked it off the list. Um, then I made a big flight to Romania, and that was the one I'd kind of been to before, so got in there in the middle of the night. That's where a lot of the group convert, I kind of came together. Mates flew in from Ireland. My brother, who had been with me in Portugal, he didn't come down as far as Tede. He, he flew directly t- to Romania with my cousin. So about it was about six, seven of us in the van together. Um, which is in good crack and stuff like that. So, uh, again, a lot of snow where there wouldn't normally be snow. Um, there was an avalanche still there that would kind of block the road that added on a couple of kilometers onto it. But it was a really enjoyable one, um, really interesting. We were driving out and next to all these beeps that had gone off and we're like, what, what is that crazy noise? And it was all our phones, a noise we hadn't ever heard from our phones before. And they all, all, the, everyone, all the phones in the van went off at the same time. And it was like bear on the loose, <laughs> be beware. Oh, yeah, so like it was the next village we were driving through. It was like it was in English actually. The, the message was like bear on the loose. Don't stop and take photographs. Please avoid the area if possible. So it's kind of wow. something I hadn't, I hadn't thought about when I was up the mountain. Probably just as well, like you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's like the, it's supposed to, there's so much maths going on and, and like uh, coordinates and everything. You're not thinking about oh, there could be wild animals here. They're dangerous. <laughs> The other thing was food because we were in that van for 48 hours pretty much nearly at, at one stage you know so it was like to buy enough food to kind of cover us all and what kind of food we, and we'd know we didn't want to bring cooking utensils with us because obviously we're moving and flying and all that kind of stuff so trying to think about what food so before i left i went to aldi and little because obviously they're all over the europe as well and i bought mm-hmm. a lot of food and we had a kind of a training event so i get takeaway food from aldi and little for a whole weekend to see how I got on eating and what I could possibly eat and kind of, you know, simulate what would happen over there. So yeah, that worked out fine. Cool um, stuff. Yeah. It, it sounds like there's, uh, you know, you, I know you said it already that, that your favorite part was the crack. It was the, it, with your friends, with your family, with, with your, yeah, everyone that came over that, that helped you get over the line. Like the, you know, the best adventures are those that are shared. And I think that's, that's shining through on this, that it wasn't just, you know, being able to, and like, it's a monumental thing that you got to do, but I think the memories won't really come from, you know, standing on the top of insert mountain name. It's, uh, it's been in that van. And, uh, Definitely, yeah. and like it started off as a Parkinson's awareness and, and it was, but it ended up being a show of how friendship can help you get over things and how important it is. And they're all mates I've had for, since I was in college, most of them like their cousins and people from home. So, so people going back years, you know, they've stayed friendly. I've stayed friendly with, and they all paid for themselves as well, you know, uh, which is a major thing. They also time off work and paid for themselves and time away from their family. So like I'm forever in debt to them for, for what they did. Um, but they all had a great time as well. They told me. 
So. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure they would. Like it looked like it. All right, definitely looking at some of the videos that you have on your social media. It looked like, as you said, like just just great crack. Just a lot yeah. of friends in a van just uh, running away from bears. Uh, yeah. <laughs> like a bit of crack. So what was the, uh, like, I know you mentioned uh, Mont Blanc being, I suppose, a particularly tough moment. Was there any other, like, really kind of tough moments that, you know, called the whole thing, thing into question? Um, just after remaining there, we did Bulgaria. Again, there was meant to be a cable car, which would have taken two and a half up and about one and a half down off the trip. It wasn't mm. working that day because we are doing repairs on it. So mm. um, Terrible look with cable cars. <laughs> Terrible. So that on four hours. So that was a long, I think it was a 13, 14 hour day up and down. And again, a lot of snow. Um, probably the one I enjoyed the most and was difficult was, um, well, two actually. Slovakia was kind of caught me off guard. Again, more snow where it shouldn't have been. It's quite vertical up. It was like crampons on for a good three hours, kind of vertically climbing. It was kind of overhanging rocks that we had to kind of rope ourselves around and kind of get over and then obviously coming down. I'm faster going up than I am coming down. Most people are faster coming down. I'm much sore because I can kind of go for it when I'm going up. When I'm coming down, the balance really comes into it and I kind of have to really take my time and stuff like that. So coming down, that was quite scary. So my friend was roped below me. The guide was above us. And like I said, there's an overhanging rock and he was actually putting my feet into into like little holes in the rocks trying to guide me down and stuff like that so it took a bit of time um, and I fell at the start as well and kind of damaged my shin a bit as well so bleeding all through it um, but uh, yeah that was, that was a tough one that I didn't think was going to be a tough one I thought it was another you know get through it and stuff like that so uh, Gross Glockner in Austria was amazing absolutely loved it tough climb uh, very rewarding stay in the hut at 3,300 metres or something like that and uh, you're just looking out into snow capped mountains all around you. My mate that was with me, one of the guys plays the guitar, Billy. Had a bit of a session inside there after our dinner, a couple of drinks. And uh, moments like that were pretty cool, like, you know what I mean? So that was, but I'd highly recommend Gross Glockner. Uh, Slovenia was beautiful as well. A long day because I did it in one day. So we got picked up at four in the morning and we got back at seven o'clock in the evening. Um, mm. So another long day. Uh, but very good rear ferrata for the last hour and a half kind of rock climb and stuff like that it's pretty, it was lucky as well the guy that had on um mont blanc mia lives in slovenia and was home in slovenia and he actually guided me for that as well so it was nice to he was someone that knew my condition and was aware and how to look after me and stuff like that because he was he was excellent as well and i kept in touch with all the guides everyone i've been with and stuff like that and like planning on going back to a couple of different places next year as well so um and then i suppose the uh, been above the Arctic Circle is pretty cool as well. Mm. Kevin the Kessa and uh, Halti in Finland. Halti in Finland was a bit scary because we went at it from the Norwegian side, and uh, again, there was a big patch of ice that the van wouldn't go over, so that had on about four kilometers and four kilometers in and out, so made it day longer. And only for the phone and kind of guiding us, it was a white out like it was just snow everywhere. Wow, uh, and we got to one point. The lad said, "Let's let's just take the picture here and pretend it's the top." I was like, "No, I can't do it. Can't do it. <laughs> Come on, please." I was like, "No, no, we can't get to it." So, um, yeah, it was a lot, another long day, but uh, Sweden was beautiful as well. Really nice. It's a day's hike into the to where you stay at the mountain hut, and the mountain hut is amazing. Like there, it's really well equipped. The food is amazing. It's like a five star meal, um, and then really good climbing. You know, very interesting and stuff like that. So. Um, again, lucky with weather in every all the different places. Like you know, mm. up there, you're above the Arctic Circle. It was twenty degrees at one stage, and the snow all around you. It's mm-hmm. kind of bad for the brain to kind of realize, you know, um, where, where you actually are. And twenty four hour brightness as well. So it was right in the middle of June. Wow! All amazing experiences. Like yeah. So I just I am still kind of hanging on the logistics of this because like you just said there it took you a day to 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 hike into somewhere it obviously took you a day to hike back out again yeah that was afterwards. the longest yeah Sweden was the longest uh, and then it was a day train journey down to to, to Denmark um so which was a cool a cool event as well because the the driver and train had a heart attack and then train was stopped and they had to get a new driver and an ambulance. So all this kind of bad stuff going on. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, it, it, like your bears, you know, heart attacks, you know, these are all things that like, I suppose when you're, 
if it's just you and a crew going, you know, one direction, you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's a lot easier. But if you're think, thinking about uh, not 28 flights, probably about what, 35, 40 flights um, across. Yeah, I, I tried to reduce the flights as best possible. And for the 28, I got down to 12 flights. Oh, brilliant. Um, yeah. I kind of, from, yeah. from my own point of view, I wanted from an environmental type of reason, you know. Yeah. Um, but it actually worked out quite well because it kind of broke down the different sections into like Eastern Europe, Central Europe, Northern, to kind of, you know, pull them all together and drive them all. And kind of, yeah, it definitely worked out, out better. Probably could have thrown in a couple of extra flights and might have made it a bit easier. I just tried to avoid as many airports as I can. Believe it or not, most of the flights went okay. I thought I wasn't going to get on the one at the peak because they'd overbooked it. But we got on. But two flights were delayed, the flight out of Ireland and the flight home to Ireland. Of course, <laughs> for the two flights that were delayed in the whole event. So, but um, yeah, logistics wise, so some Luxembourg, Belgium, and Holland four hours and up the tree of them out of, the, out of there. It's just drive, drive. They're all quite close to each other. Um, right. Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, probably a day and a half not to tree of them out of it. Um, I flew from Greece to Cyprus in the morning. Did Cyprus, flew to Malta, did that in the evening, so we got two done on that day. So they're kind of saved in some of them. Then Austria took two days to do, Sweden took three days to do. So your gains and losses in different places squeeze it all into 28 days anyway. And what would have been, uh, apart from Sweden, I suppose, like, because uh, you're, you're, I suppose you're, you're hiking into a point, what would have been the longest actual hike that you would have done? Uh, I think Bulgaria was 14 and a half hours. Wow. Um, yeah, because obviously that cable car wasn't working and stuff like that. So it was around that, yeah. And uh, that and, um, yeah, long day with Slovenia, probably about 12 hours hiking, but it was it was tough going, very shaly and stuff like that. So it was quite a hard mm. going on, on the feet. And then an hour and a half, we had at the top, an hour and a half back down to a certain section and then hike all the way back as, as well. But, uh, yeah, long day. The 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 because like, um, I think anyone you know I I do a bit of running myself and, and the hiking obviously as well and if you're ever doing like a big like Mont Blanc like you probably are, are going to be training for a few months before you get up there but to do Mont Blanc and then twenty seven other mountains uh, as well as the the hikes in and out uh, out in them that must have been a serious amount of training that you you had done yeah I probably started about eight months before I left um running hiking and kind of doing a few gym sessions um believe it or not when you have parkinson's one of the things you suffer from is apathy so to get yourself yeah. off the chair and get out there sometimes but having that focus and having something to, to, to aim for really really helped um probably could have been fitter I, I kind of beat myself up sometimes you know could i have done a bit more and worked in a bit of balance and worked in a bit of strength and would have been okay for Mont Blanc? um but I, i'll never know um yeah, it was a lot of training, but I enjoyed the training. Um, kind of did a, a, a mock weekend in Ireland where we did the highest point in each of the four provinces over a weekend. That was good. Relearning really learning curve as well, you know, about living in a van and kind of sleeping and stuff like that. Everyone asked me about sleep. Like, what did I do? I have, I can sleep anywhere. Um, my mates used to call me I nap. Because I used to <laughs> nap everywhere. Uh, so, uh, yeah, and without being able to do that, I don't think I would have ever done it. So when I got into the van, Boom, mm. I'd fall asleep in the back. Even for only an hour, you know, I'd take, take a nap. Because some places we got to hotels at half two in the morning, had a shower, mm. went to bed at three o'clock, was up at half four and gone. So like literally getting an hour and a half in the hotel um, just getting a quick nap. Um, yeah, but towards the end, I finished Ben Nevis and uh, we came off Ben Nevis and I only had Karen two left the next day. So we're having a lunch. And I was literally chatting away to the lads and halfway through my sentence, I fell into my plate. <laughs> 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 the head just dropping straight into my food. <laughs> I was like, oh, bounce back up. Yeah, so it was really starting to kick in then. Um, yeah, t- t- the 26th day of finishing kind of Belgium, Luxembourg and Holland, we got on the uh, Euro Tunnel across London, then got the train up to up to Edinburgh. And at that stage, you knew I wanted to finish. Like, I've had enough. I was tired. Yeah. And... Uh, yeah, it was a great day in Karen too. The last day, it really, really was like you know. Was I was going to say so that that's like you're you're finishing on home on home soil as well. And you know what was that like when you when you finally got to the top? 
Yeah, it was great because I mentioned at the start, it's kind of where the whole journey started when my friend brought me down in Klein Karen Tool. So I always wanted to be the last one. I want to be back in Ireland as well to do it. And the charity I was involved with kind of put on a bit of an event down there. Loads of family and friends, you know, people that wanted to do, people that raised money for to do it as well. So it was really re- well run event. Um, yeah, getting to the top, it was it was emotional. Like it definitely was emotional. Like you know, to see so many of my friends there and have people that wanted to come out and do it with me, and a lot of people hadn't done it before. Mm. You know, and uh, people were like, "Jesus, oh, how did you do it all the twenty eight mountains?" And I was there to. I only climbed Karen Tool for the first time four or five years ago. So this is your first time doing it, you know, now. So like you could potentially do what, you know, you could kick on from here and do a lot more. So, um, and you could have probably done it earlier as well if it wasn't for COVID, you know, like you had yeah. that. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, you know? Definitely. And like kind of, if I'd done it a year or two earlier, would my Parkinson symptoms have been, been as bad? Would I manage better? Yeah. You can say it, you know, whatever, but, uh, yeah, the, still needs to be done. So it was, uh, Logistical sleeping efforts, uh, eating efforts, all that kind of stuff. It was it all came off, and was very lucky that it kind of came together. I, ha- I can't record an episode of this podcast without asking about food. So, what was your food highlight of the entire trip? When you're up a mountain, right, and you're staying in a mountain hut, and they, they don't do any special meals for everyone. It's it's what they do, but like they do start as main course and dessert, and I don't know what it is. The food just tastes amazing because there's a climb up a mountain and if they put slop in front of you, they go, this is amazing. It was just really, really good. But the best was actually in the Italian, uh, when we climbed Grand Paradiso, yeah, and which was the first one we did, which wasn't part of the 28. It was kind of the training mountain before Mont Blanc. Yeah, the Italians know how to look after you. Definitely the food was amazing and uh, really nice people there as well. And I would say every mountain, all the huts were really nice people, but... Austria and Italy would definitely get my vote for the best food. Oh, Sweden, Sweden was good as well. That was like five star. But they, they, the Sweden, when we were staying in the hut in Sweden, came to Castle Hut, they came out and kind of made a presentation about what they're going to serve tonight and describe where they got the ingredients from. It was like, Jesus, I just I, I need anything now. Just give me my food. You know? <laughs> but uh, it was really, really good. Um, I didn't drink during the whole thing. My mates had a few pints here and there as well. It was always the local beer and stuff like that, but we didn't, we didn't go crazy. Kept that till the end. So um, yeah, enjoyed that beer the last day. Yeah. Oh, well that, that'll have to be the next challenge is going to all 28 countries and, and uh, <laughs> trying the local ales, trying the local beers. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if I do the 28 in a row again, but I definitely think about doing, doing something similar. Yeah. So what time. is what is next? Is have you any anything else planned? Any other hike, big hiking events or outdoor things planned? Yeah, um, I'm heading down to to uh, Westport this weekend to do Seed the Summit. Oh, brilliant! Um, and a uh, couple of runs here and there. Kind of, kind of got back more. I ran a marathon a few years ago, so I've done a bit of running before. So I'm trying to get back into that. Um, trying to push that a bit more. I did a half marathon there recently, and. Uh, Probably why I haven't been up the mountains as much because I'm trying to concentrate on the run and trying to get a bit bit fitter. But I will get back to mountains. I am going back to some of the places it was last year just to do you know weekend of Slovakia and Poland or weekend. My one, my brother wants to go do gross gross Glockner with me in Austria and stuff for like that. So planning on going back to one or two of them. Maybe the year after I'll do a big event. I I, I haven't been over five thousand meters, so that's kind of the next thing to do. The next so, big thing, yeah. Yeah, I think if I'm doing that, I might as well do something epic and maybe do a few 5,000ers in a row or something like that. So, <laughs> Just see, not one, but three. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's the attitude. But uh, yeah, uh, in terms of outdoor stuff, yeah, just trying to stay fit all the time. I'm very lucky where I live. Um, Cumption gone in Cummers is like 20 minutes out the road, 15, 20 minutes. So that was my regular training ground, you know what I mean? I was going down Cumption gone two or three times just to practice. And... Uh, yeah, the Cummers are a great, great uh, resource there, right in my doorstep as well. So kind of always heading up around them. So uh, I haven't been to Donegal, so I'm, I want to go up there and do a bit of, bit of, bit of and I haven't done much in the mornings either. So there's loads in, in Ireland just oh. to keep me happy. You know? Yeah, I was just going to say, like it, 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 like Coom, uh, the Coomers are right at your doorstep, but then, you know, Ireland in, in, as a whole, like you've got the experience now of having to hike you know, and get trains, you know, from one end of the country to the other. Whereas we, you know, you can drive for two hours and you'll be in, um, in, in probably in Cork, 
yeah. uh, another two hours if you're up in the morns another two hours if you're over in westport you know you just there's there's so many things within like you, you can get up at six and be at the mountains by by eight you know and um, it's so I close think, yeah even like Kerry, like you're spoiled for choices so much down there as well yeah. like you know so um yeah there's a lot a lot to do so uh well i'll go a couple of small trips abroad i want to concentrate a bit more in ireland next year and then we'll see the year after what i'll do so yeah well, there's, a, there's a there's a um the the ardorans all the all the peaks if you want to just knock off all the the, the 100 highest peaks in ireland there's there's a, a list there for you to do maybe you might do it in a day you know <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm always trying to find something that somebody hasn't done before, you know. Yeah, it's kind of always a challenge to myself. So um, that's kind of where I'm going with the five thousand meter thing as well. So um, yeah, we'll wait and see. Good stuff. Well, look, Ian, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on. I, I could sit here all day and chat to you about each individual uh, hike and you know the 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 highs and lows of them all. But I think what you've done regardless of, of reaching one or two of the peaks, you know, it's absolutely inspiring. It's, it's amazing. And, you know, not just as a, ch- a physical challenge, but what you've done it for the, the cause that you've done it for um, and how much awareness you, you've brought to this and the money that you've raised as well, you know, to, 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 to put the, the cherry on top of it. Um, I there, that one, thanks. Yeah. It, 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 uh, before we go, is there, is there anything you want to, to, I suppose, any kind of, wisdom you want to impart or anything you want to say to to our audience definitely definitely um obviously been diagnosed with parkinson's and kind of even listen back to some of your own podcasts you've done with people and like been on social media a lot of people wait until something happens to them before they kind of get out and start living a bit of life whether it's been diagnosed whether it's personally been diagnosed with something or the loss of a family friend or or some family member you know we you always see people they tend to wait until something like that happens to really embrace life get out yeah. there and embrace it now do something now don't wait for something to happen you know it's great you know it's great for me like uh, you know I, i've done something now but again it was after i kind of got a diagnosis so just get out there start enjoying life and the great thing about the hiking community there's, there's such a variety of groups now on online and stuff like that and you know People say social media, you kind of, you know, people can go into themselves a bit more and kind of, I, I see social media from the hiking point of view is really bringing people together, groups yeah. and put together on it. And uh, Jesus, like, you know, you're at, at the, on a Monday there, you're looking back over all the groups and where they've been all over the weekend, they're all over Ireland, they're starting to go abroad. And it's really great. It's a great community. It's really growing in Ireland and it's great to see and hopefully it'll continue. Yeah, uh, uh, here, here to that. I definitely think the hiking community, both here and internationally, is is growing um and uh the internet and social media has just been a fantastic vessel for that for all its faults it has been the reason one of the biggest reasons why it's been it's been so explosive um but yeah again ian thank you so much for coming on to the show and and and, and chatting to us and thanks so yeah, if anyone could uh do anything I'd, I'd say like go onto your website go on to i'll put it into the show notes but it's, yeah, I believe, I just make sure i don't butcher the uh the url uh, European, so EU, yeah. EU or U P I A N dot com. You're up, Ian. Yeah. Um, which is clever play on words. Uh, I, I, I thought it was until everyone asked you how how do you spell that, and I was trying to explain it, and some people were looking at the word and couldn't see it, and I was like, oh, I have a, I made a mistake here or <laughs> what? But uh, yeah, it's your up, Ian. So thanks it's very still, much. It, 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 it does the job. Um, so yeah visit the website, check out your so- socials uh, and just, yeah, uh, support any way you can for early onset uh, Parkinson's. Um, but Ian, yep, yeah, thanks very much. Here's and uh, best of luck with everything else. Thanks a million, man. Thanks so much again to Ian for coming onto the show and sharing his story with us. Uh, I could have sat with him for hours talking about each and every single hike that he went on to and Maybe I will one of these days. Maybe we'll do a series uh, dedicated specifically to this challenge. I cannot wait to see what Ian does next. Uh, He left a a strong impression on me uh, that he is not finished. He is he's got a lot more things, a lot more adventures uh, that he wants to, uh, to achieve in his life. So I cannot wait to see what he does next. That's it for this week. Thank you again for tuning in, uh, listening and watching. If you're watching this on YouTube, Uh, We'll be back again next week and until then, happy trails.